What's up, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode of the Willing Gas Service Podcast. We're here with Andy Ice from Petrospecs. It sounds like a wrestler name if you think about it. Andy Ice? Andy Ice. Okay. Or like an old school like 80s video game, like the main yeah. character. Or a Vanilla Ice kind of thing. Ooh, possibly. I just went to his concert. It was awesome. Was it? Best concert I've ever been to. I totaled my first car to Ice Ice Baby. <laughs> I shit you not. Mustang. 96 Mustang coming around the corner. Janet Ice Ice Baby. Boom. Head on collision with another Mustang. Mustang nice. on Mustang that crime. Sounds like a hell of a 90s and blonde party. Being 16, I was I was blamed, nice. unfortunately. Nice. So, Andy, what do you guys do at Petrospex? All right. Getting right into it. Um, so there's a lot of problems in the industry or in the shale space, mm -hmm. uh, specifically around fracture-driven interactions. Okay. Um, the lack of coordination is an issue. So in multiple basins, you've got operators that are doing rudimentary um, spreadsheets and phone calls and things just to like kind of stay in, in coordination. There's a lot of workflows that are insufficient, mm -hmm. uh, regulatory requirements that are insufficient, and just the lack of coordination can cause a lot of expensive issues, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a frack hit, that's a problem. If you hit a drilling rig, it's really a problem. How about you? Wh wh let's explain what a frack hit is for those. Sure. Who don't know. Uh, within the industry, it's called a fracture of an interaction. These are subsurface communication paths between wells, producing wells, wells you're drilling, wells you're fracking. And um, when those wells communicate with high pressure and a lot of rate, these are issues that can cause um, a lot of sand to get in your producing wells or your shut-in wells, even your abandoned wells. Mm -hmm. And then on a drilling rig, you can start to see a pressure increase. That's an issue. Okay. Right? So uh, it's a safety issue. It's a regulatory issue. What are, um, what are some of the, like the biggest, so obviously, you know, regulatory issue, you get shit in where it's not supposed to be right from a safety standpoint, what are some of like the, I don't know, maybe dare I say some of the worst things you've seen? So personally, I don't know of any true injuries caused by a yeah. frack hit per se, but the risk is there, right? Mm -hmm. If you're on a drilling rig and you're not expecting to see a pressure increase, you're always ready for it, but you get that unexpected one because somebody's fracking down the road you just weren't expecting to see that hit now you've got to get that well in control you've got to you know, take a lot of extra precautions shut down right potentially for days uh you're shutting down that that frack crew for days it's expensive right mm -hmm. in the event you didn't have it under control or it was such a significant kick yeah that can be a safety issue so, so from, it's taken very seriously yeah from, from like a well performance perspective i mean is it is it you have a frack hit, does it automatically just totally jack the well or does it, it is like a temporary thing and then it kind of goes back to normal? Like walk me through that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So interestingly, in some basins, such as the Bakken, a frack hit can actually mobilize oil and get things moving mm -hmm. in, a, in an offset well. You can see a, an improvement in the well performance, yeah. a mature well or, or a recently drilled and completed well. That's a bit of an exception in most basins. It's seen as a negative mm -hmm. to a production uh, impact. Um, and just generally from a scheduling perspective, it's not beneficial to mm -hmm. be interfering uh, with each other among operators yeah. or within their own operations. Yeah. Yeah. So how does, so you have two operators that come in and they're drilling, I don't know, it's in somewhat close proximity to each other without really talking about what you guys do yet. How, how do they, how do they communicate that? Hey, I'm here, you're here. Is there like a centralized database? Is that like through the, in Texas, say the railroad commission? Sure. Like wh where do you find that information? How do they know? Sure. So that's where a central coordinating group is nice, right? Mm -hmm. A community of operators with engineers or technicians or planners that are on the same page constantly, yeah. right? In some basins that's been there for years or a decade or more, such as the DJ basin, that infrastructure was in place with those specific so do, people. Do they do that the best? DJ does, yes. Okay. And then that was why it was so easy for them to adopt track frack, right? Okay. They were already doing this. Track frack came in and was able to just simply automate and track that frack for shells them. product, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Track frack is the software. Okay. Um, in other basins, uh, emailing single spreadsheets that are managed by a third party company or just by a singular operator with one person sort of in charge of kind of coordinating this amongst all the operators, or it's just not done very well, right? And uh, then you run into those instances where a few mistakes, a few mm -hmm. scheduling conflicts where you've got to rearrange a bunch of your operations or, um, or you actually have frack hits and then you realize that ah, maybe we should be doing this. Yeah. Better, so it right? sounds like something that's like wildly uh, expensive uh, and risky. 
And yet there is no like standardized kind of process or like any sort of visibility into, hey, how do we avoid this? So how did you guys, how did you guys come up with this idea? Did you guys live this? Is that what it was? Uh, <clears throat> we've all lived it in certain ways. Right? Yeah. Um, I was in the industry for a long time, uh, 17 years now. And uh, so, you know, these interactions are happening. You feel the pain of when you thought you were going to be fracking in one area and then it's like, oh, the schedule changes sometimes because of these issues, right? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of that just industry pain that, that's out there that, that can be solved with improved collaboration. Um, where did we start? Interesting question. So in 2018, yeah, let's, let's go to, let's go to both of y'all's backgrounds. Yeah. yeah Rob, sure. Rob couldn't make it. Got yeah, sorry guys. Rob, we, we Rob, just got Andy today. Yeah. Rob Lindbergh <laughs> really wanted to be here. Quick background on Rob. Cause he's got an awesome story. He ran a, well, he runs a company called the venture 15 yeah. years in the marketing space, yeah. uh, advocacy for the industry, leading a lot of campaigns, hundreds of campaigns in, in, in multiple States. Um, he was having, or he also ran, um, Bakken backers for anybody listening that's familiar with the, with the Bakken several years ago, there was a nice advocacy campaign run by the NDPC. He ran that. It was called Bakken backers. So sunglasses, shirts, golf events and stuff. Mm. Everybody saw it. So he's got an awesome background. He's having a conversation in October, 2018, I think. And, um, with Hess, okay. interestingly, I hope I'm allowed to say that. You said with, <laughs> <laughs> with Hess and just a casual conversation among friends. He's got a lot of friends in the industry and you know, the guy made a recommendation, Hey, somebody should be helping the industry coordinate this. Right. So Rob, he's a basement tinkerer. He got to work right away. Tw late 2018 coding a, pl a single platform that scrapes all the state data knows where every single well is all the operators. And it simply automates offset well identification and um, sends the notifications. So at the free basic level of service and value to the industry, that's, that's what he created in 2018. Okay. Uh, so launched 2019, got some funding, redid the platform 2020, um, brought on the Bakken or sorry, the, uh, DJ basin in 2019 and, um, really got going there. So Rob's got a great background. I love the story that he built this in his basement, mm -hmm. then started to build the organization around it and, yeah. and, and growing and scaling. Yeah. My background is um, 13 years with Halliburton, starting in okay. 2005 in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Um, did a lot of different stints in operations, design engineering, testing. Uh, did a lot of interesting international projects uh, with, with Halliburton um, in the completions tool space. And then uh, really got to cut my teeth in leadership in North Dakota. Uh, got to oversee the tools department there and run a couple different PSLs there, product service lines. And... Um, in 2019, Equinor picked me up. So I got to go work for Equinor in Austin. So that's where I live now. I love Austin. Thank you, Equinor, for taking me there. <laughs> Didn't realize the state of the business and just yeah. generally the industry around that time, 2019, 2020. You're still working on completions in Equinor? Uh, it was in research and development, so okay. in the technology team, but I was always focused on completions tools and different fracturing okay. technologies. So we were working on different downhill tools, simulfrac, that kind of thing, getting those implemented in the assets. Okay. So it was, a, it was a very neat experience, but a very tumultuous time for the company. So did you meet Rob with your time up in, in North Dakota? Yeah. Okay. So funny there. I was on a Conoco well site. He uh, had a bunch of delegates on a bus and needed somebody to explain what was going on on this site, right? It was a Halliburton frac site. They were pumping. We were running the bus around location. <laughs> and so I got to stand there in front of this delegate delegation uh, from Eastern North Dakota. They try to bring East and West together sometimes because they kind of vote differently and, you know, it's two different sides of the state, right? So I got to explain what is a frac site? What are we doing out here in Western North Dakota? What is oil? What is gas? What are these things? And he told me that was the best, um, the best representation of the industry he had ever seen. And I really appreciated that. I took that to heart and that sort of laid the foundation for both of our relationships. So when, when, so when did you join with, with Rob on this and journey? So you were, you were at Equinor. When, when did you make the leap? Made the leap August of this year, August 22nd. So I'm brand new to Rob's business. Yeah. Brand new to Petra specs and, and the track rock platform, brand new to the digital software side of the industry. Cause everything yeah. I dealt with before I had big rubber wheels on it and metal and rubber and things mm -hmm. that would go down in the well. Now being on the digital software space, yeah. it's, it's very, very interesting, I should say. So we, we didn't really talk about exactly what it is. So you guys, so it's a, is it a centralized 
uh, database that customers can log into? Is it like, is it, is it SaaS? Like walk me through all that. Like what sure you sign up, what do you get? Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's software as a service, right? Okay. That that's the product. Um, it's a collaborative space. It's a digital dashboard. You can think of it like a regional frat calendar, right? Okay. So operators are the clients. They log on as users. They share their upcoming frac schedules. And we put that in a digital form in terms of a Gantt chart so they can see it on a calendar. They can click on an individual well that they've uploaded. We identify every offset so they can see the status of those offset wells and look at a map view and just get kind of that localized view around their well of what activity is happening nearby on any of their wells assets in the basement. And um, if they're a, the, the operator fracking, they can see the status of those offset wells. So any user can go in, update the status of their offsets, see that there's a frack coming up, plan all their resources to get ready for that frack, because frack protect is a whole subset of the industry. It's a large mm -hmm. operation to make sure your wells, your assets are ready for this frack to happen, say a half mile or a mile away, mm -hmm. right? So we don't get into the predictive space. We don't do any subsurface insights or anything like that. We simply lay out the schedule that the operators provide us. Put that in a map form, put that in a table form. We take a simple CSV upload, that's their schedule. If the, um, if the data points in the well that we need, such as the surface hole is always gonna be there, the well head location, mm -hmm. the heel point, toe point that allows us to draw the horizontal well, if those aren't quite in the state database yet, we'll take those, we'll take that information from the operator. Okay. And just build a shape file based off of that. Okay. Anytime the state data gets updated, and we scrape that every single day, and then we can draw out the well bore once we have that. So you're combining the public information with everything that everybody else is uploading. Correct. Right. And is it? Are you are you publicly? Let me back up real quick. So from the, on the ENP side, is it only other customers that are uploading the information, or do you have like access to you know certain frac schedules that you're also able to pull in? Sure. So the only frac schedules we have are the ones that we're provided with. Okay. There's no database yeah. that I know of a future sketch frac schedules. Okay. Right. So we get the future schedules, and we take more than frac. We'll take drilling schedules. We'll take frac protect schedules and well servicing schedules. You combine all those four. That's a rich data set from a mm -hmm. calendar perspective that allows the whole industry to do better, mm -hmm. right? And we're, we're not going into like super proprietary information. You could consider the future schedules. There's some proprietary level to that, mm -hmm. but they're sharing these schedules amongst each other generally anyways, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, you know, how the well is gonna perform or something special that they did, yeah. right? To, or that they're planning on these wells. Um, it's just simply putting the schedules out there and allowing them to collaborate and work better together. And I, Go ahead. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was, you know, <laughs> traditionally getting getting any of these operators to work together is like, you know, pulling teeth, right? Yeah. So how is the how is the adoption bit when you come in? Is it like, boom, light bulb, we see the value proposition, this makes sense. I'm not worried about it. Like, I'm not worried yeah. about letting people know they're going to find out anyways. Or is it, has there been some sort of resistance too? Yeah, like anything, like yeah. any new technology, any two plat, any singular platform, you're always going to find pockets of resistance. It depends who you talk to in the company, right? If you're the lean champion, if you're the safety champion, if you're the, hey, how do we figure out how to eliminate or streamline certain workflows or what is AI, what is ML, you know, what are these things? What is data analytics? Bringing in a digital platform like this is actually a low bar. It's a very simple value proposition, a regional frat calendar of sorts. Everybody work together in this single space. You're already doing it or you should be doing it. It's not that hard of a sell, but the sales cycle, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now you go back to what I said about the DJ Basin. They were already doing this, right? They had a calendar. They had all these things. We just simply made that a whole lot easier for them and gave a single tool that everybody can kind of latch on to. Now mm -hmm. you take an area like the Bakken, for example, right now we're talking to multiple operators there. It's not a simple sell, right? I know there's hopefully some people listening right now <laughs> like, hey guys, come on, let's do yeah. this. You know, and that Thinking of a community, thinking of collaboration, there's a lot of buzz around that right now in the industry right now, but really the boots on the ground, getting people to truly collaborate, especially about future schedule stuff, it's not easy. But mm -hmm. the day you kind of hit a top operator, sort of critical mass in a basin, give a central platform that enough people are using, then everybody kind of comes on board. It, it, it makes a lot of sense to me, and that's why I joined yeah. Rob. It was a very yeah. simple simple tool for a set of not that complicated of problems really mm -hmm. and it's and it helps solve them yeah 
what what are, what are the advantages? Obviously, avoiding disaster and wait time and things like that. But from a from a if I if I'm an EMP and I'm looking at just scheduling with my vendors right on the OFS side, what are some of the advantages there of just having access to this information? Sure. So it's a it's a rich data set, right? That um, they might not have access to this much information organically within the community if there is a community of people trying to coordinate this level of information. In three states, there's a regulatory requirement, Oklahoma, North Dakota, and Colorado. Colorado, for sure, with all the setback things. What, what kind of regulatory requirements are we talking about? Um, how many days in advance of a frack that you need to notify your offsets within okay. a certain distance, right? So having a tool that automatically easily identifies those offsets, it's 100% accurate based off of state data. What would be the radius of, of a qualified offset or something like that? Yeah, so max distance is two miles of okay. concern. Okay. Uh, and then it's up, kind of up to the operator what distance they want to set of their concern if they're the offset. Two, two miles subsurface from the surface. Well, okay. at, from the well officially, you know, from a distance calculation, you've got the whole horizontal section. Yeah. So really, it's the toe, two miles out from the toe in any direction, two mm -hmm. miles out from the surface or the heel point. Okay. Uh, so two miles is the max that, that the tool will function. You can set your distance anywhere within that two miles. Um, so if you're only concerned within 300 feet or the state only needs you to notify officially within a certain number of feet, you can set your parameters around that. And we'll send those notifications automatically. Oh, so you'll send it. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's nice the basic question. value proposition, yeah. right? Is look, give us your schedule, give us the API number, the dates, maybe a couple extra bits of information if the state doesn't have them, depending on the well, um, how long the wells existed. And um, we'll put that in the system, identify every offset, put it on the calendar. You'll, you'll be able to see all your wells, all your assets, all the, offset activity and we'll send the notifications out 90 60 25 days 48 hours whatever that requirement is mm -hmm. we'll send that notification automatically so it's taken a workflow in three states that they have to do anyways and we're just doing it for them yeah right it's taking somebody having to look at a map identify every offset well did i hit them all like what's that little dot on that map is that a well i don't know if it's in the state database and we can scrape that and we can identify that well. We do, and we automatically let those operators know. If we don't have an email address for the operator, we'll help get it. It seems like the value proposition is so obvious and like clear as day. So it boggles my mind that you would have any sort of pushback or like super <laughs> long sell cycles. Um, look, operators have established workflows. Yeah. They need to be in compliance. They need to be good neighbors. So they have ways of doing this currently, right? And for many operators, and I hear this every day, the way we do it today, it, it works. And we could get into that and say, well, how much time does it take? How many people does that touch within the company just to make sure your, all your ducks are in a row? If you're trying to disrupt the way you currently do it, you're always going to encounter some resistance, right? And just naturally adopting new tools takes some time. But I do believe, and that's why I came to the company, that this is a process, this is a tool that will bring value. And ultimately, I think it'll get there. Are there any other features or things that you guys are working on maybe behind the scenes you want to tease a little bit? Like anything that, you're, <laughs> you're, that you can talk about? I mean, that maybe you've, you, you've discovered through, you know, onboarding some new customers? Sure. Um, all the tools within the system, we listen to the clients, right? Yeah. We listen to our DJ clients that have been using this for a couple of years. There's a tool called SimOps Watchman, SimOps meaning simultaneous operations, not within a well pad, but within an area, multiple pads with multiple different operations going. That tool's really neat. It, it exists today. It's existed for about a year. Um, I think it's cool because having worked for Equinor, I see mm -hmm. a lot of people doing a lot of different yep. things on four floors in Austin. And one of those things that they're spending a lot of time doing is long range planning. Okay. And now you're putting... What, what does long range planning mean? You're figuring out where you're going to drill, getting mm -hmm. all your midstream assets lined up, all your volumes figured out, looking at all of your, um, well, individual well pad and area forecasts and just making sure the whole business is aligned to, we're going to put this money in this area and everything's got to work after that. There's a lot of risks and unknowns in there. Well, to me, one of those risks and unknowns is, did you pick an area that's going to be super high activity with all your neighbors, right? So you just drilled a bunch of wells, multiple pads of wells. Do you really want to run the risk of having to shut them in for four months, potentially, or mm -hmm. more? Your midstream team might not be too happy, right, if you didn't coordinate that very well. So I think there's a nice value proposition there for long-range planning where you're putting 
tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases into an area. And it would be nice to be able to avoid your neighbors if possible, right? Those, those, I'm sure those conversations in the background aren't fun when you're like, Hey, I'm planning to drill here. Okay. Well, I'm planning to frack here. Now what? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, you're potentially shutting in good wells mm. and it's not ideal obviously to shut in wells from a volumes and sales perspective, but also just the, the damage potential that you can put on, on producing wells by having to shut them in for extended periods of time, injects risk into the business. There's just risk all around. Why not do this all a little bit better? What else can I tease? I do like the idea that as an industry, having a data set that kind of allows you to see what's going to go on mm -hmm. in the future, just think of like a heat map, right? Like where is activity going to be? Well, having future schedules does, does allow you to have some of that data, right? So what is, what is the right way to use a data set, right? Like that. The value we need to bring is to the operators. Operators also get value when the whole industry can perform better, right? Well, there's a lot of service companies out there. The whole apparatus that allows operators to function is dependent on a bunch of service companies really delivering results, delivering quality, delivering safety, having the materials and the people and the technology in the right place at the right time. I tend to think that having the ability to support forecasting in an area, either an area within a basin or just a basin in general, I think it has the potential to rise to let all boats lift, right? Mm -hmm. with, a, um, with a rising tide. And I think a data set like that could have that value for the industry. But those are choppy waters, right? Yeah, you gotta yeah. figure out, is there even a potential to we've, use We've talked about that for years about, like it's essentially the, the concept that you guys have here where it's like an opt-in kind of thing and, and maybe the dashboard, so to say, of like what's actually happening, maybe it is, you know, somewhat, you know, anonymized so that you're not like yeah. giving everything away, but saying like, oh, there's a shitload of activity happening over here. This is really interesting. Oh, maybe we should go and like mobilize over in this area, yeah. right? Like it blows my mind that we don't see more of that. And I just feel like it's such, like you said, like rising tide raises all ships. So like, I'm just surprised that we haven't seen more of like cross collaboration. I mean, this is more than we've ever seen, but like yeah. I, I expected a lot more to be honest with you yeah. at this point in time. And, and I'm, and I'm the same way, you know, I go to conferences like you guys at Fuse and you go to other conferences and those are easy places to have these let's collaborate. Let's all work together. We've got to, right. If we're yeah. going to navigate this transition, <laughs> you know, and, and, and do it in the right prudent way that doesn't sink civilizations. Yeah. Right. And allows us to do as an en energy industry, what we need to do. And, um, it's easy to say those things, right. Especially in those settings, drinking mm -hmm. beer, enjoying the weather and having great conversations. Uh, it's another thing, again, back to what I said earlier, you know, the boots on the ground, getting that collaboration instilled within the culture mm -hmm. of the industry and then individual operators. There, there are definitely barriers <laughs> to that. Right. And, um, I, I, I'm like you though. Um, I think shale operators need to work together in certain areas. There's al always going to be healthy competition, but when the industry can do better, and I'm talking millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars better on an mm -hmm. individual basin perspective. Think about shutting in wells too early, bringing them online too late, right? Because you didn't coordinate schedules as tight yeah. as you could be. Having scheduling conflicts that are shutting in perfectly good wells, right? Or having to mobilize resources that were working on a job already. Now you got to bring them over to this other area. Forget what you were doing over there that was probably important. Now you got to bring them over here to prepare for this frack. That's just pure inefficiency in terms of if there was one company or like a state running a basin, you would definitely do this, right? You would, you would figure out a central yeah. way to coordinate all the activities, right? Think of like flight control, right? This is much lower volume, arguably lower risk um, than, than trying to coordinate a bunch of planes in the sky. But it, it's a similar type of value where if you can just break down a couple of these walls, get operators on the same page, drive out those inefficiencies, mm -hmm. eliminate a bunch of workflows from within their walls, do it better, right? Don't miss a well. And then you're producing more barrels at lower risk. How's oh, that a bad thing? Yeah. <laughs> I love, I love ideas like this because it's like, it seems like it's, it's so obvious, but nobody until Rob really wanted to like take the bull by the horns. Yeah. You know, like you said, it's not like overly complex or anything. It's just yeah. like, literally let's just 
provide some visibility to each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and like you said earlier, it sounds simple when you're trying to express it to, to an operator, a group of engineers, completion engineers or executives, everybody kind of gets it, you know, and some mm -hmm. enthusiastically get it. Others are like, oh man, that's going to change my day to day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, that sounds like more work. So you got to go through all those, all yeah. those hurdles. And it can take many, many months to, yeah. to overcome that, but we can demo, we can, you know, come in, we'll buy lunch, you know, we'll do all these things. And, and uh, at the end of the day, I think once enough operators in a given basin are, are ready to mm -hmm. sort of coalesce around yeah. a single solution. Yeah. Then we're, we're ready to go. So are you, I, I didn't ask this. Are you guys focused on a, a certain basin now or a few basins now, or are you just kind of everywhere? Yeah. I've been in the DJ for a few years. Okay. So fully proven as a platform in the okay. DJ, very happy clients there and essentially most operators, if not all are, are sort of on the system either as a basic user or a paid user using all the features. Mm -hmm. uh, Bakken, probably next. We're also building a client base of interested parties within the um, Powder River. Got several operators now interested in the Anadarko. They perceive this as very high operating risk with a lack of coordination. So, you know, they're looking to us to hopefully build a user community there to solve some of their problems on an individual basis. Not really focused on West Texas right now. Of course, it's a Big opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's a, a company there that provides a single sort of frack calendar solution. Doesn't work the way ours does. Mm -hmm. They're probably getting by over there. You know, there, yeah. aren't, there aren't major incidences, at least not that I hear of. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into West Texas when we're ready. Uh, Northeast, of course, would be probably next on the, on yeah. the list. What's, what's the goal, say, like three years from now? Yeah, good question. Um, I think there's more that the platform can do. So I am looking at more, I haven't talked to Rob about this yet, probably should, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think there's a way to, uh, to overlay some more subsurface insights okay. into, into the system. And so starting to have some of those conversations with, uh, with potential providers of um, more frack modeling, geophysical modeling, um, what is a basic overlay we could put on a frack calendar to bring value to the clients, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe you can extend out the, the area of concern or the radius of concern in some areas or some directions around a well pad, bring it in on another side. You of course want to worry about regulatory, cover the minimums, mm -hmm. right? But then if you can either control your own operations with a little bit more knowledge and data or your offset operator options, uh, if there's a way to um, sort of hone in on the radius of concern, I think that would be interesting, but I'm just starting to have those conversations now. Oh, I love that, man. You're, you're trying to find just additional ways that you can continue to provide value, yeah. right, in that same platform. Yeah. So what is, if anybody wants to reach out, right? So if you're in the DJ, you're in the Bakken, you're in the Anadarko, you're interested, what, what's the website? Sure. It's um, petrospecs.com. How do you spell that? P-E-T-R-O-S-P-E-C-T-S.com. Okay. You can also search for track frack. It'll come right up, D-R-A-C-F-R-A-C. Um, you can reach out to Rob Lindbergh or myself. Cool. Dude, thanks for making it out. Thanks, thanks for coming on Austin. Thanks I'm going to be in your stomping grounds this week too. So oh, awesome. We'll come to Austin <laughs> anytime. Sounds good. Thanks, man.